I wanted her to cook American foods, like hamburgers. If we could just have a hamburger, if we could just have chicken noodle soup, Lipton's chicken noodle soup, or something like that, like something that was in the culture. The meat, I like to cook vegetables. Okay. I'm good at it. Cooking vegetables? Cutting them. Okay. But I liked cooking. That was the thing. I, li I loved being in the kitchen with my grandmother and my great-grandmother, and they would make these really complicated and wonderful dishes that would take hours, and I loved to help them. Um, I have always felt somewhat alienated both from U.S. culture and even from feminists, American feminists, on the one hand, and from Armenian-American culture, um, on the other hand. Juicy and it's yep, yep, succulent yep. and it's... Um, and I always felt like an outsider. I mm -hmm. felt like an outsider um, in many different communities, but I also felt like an outsider in the Armenian community. I also think that I, in some ways, look a little different. And I, as I travel around different parts of the United States, if I'm in northern Michigan, I realize not very many people look as I do. And so um, to have dark hair and dark eyes and to understand something of its legacy um, has been important. I was born in New York City, in a section of New York City um, called Washington Heights uh, at the end of the 30s. And um, I never thought of this area as being an Armenian neighborhood, but I found out years later that it was an Armenian neighborhood. In fact, it, it was where the church, one of the major churches was. I think about it now and I think about how could I not have known this was an Armenian community. And in a way, I think it's because I was so separated from being Armenian. Well, at least once I started to go to school and once I got affected by the parts of the culture that told me uh, that being different was not what you were supposed to be. And so I ran very quickly towards that image of what an American was supposed to be. And I kind of drove my mother crazy because, well, I wouldn't speak the language. That was one big thing because real Americans don't speak Armenian, they have to speak English. And I wouldn't let my, bro my brother speak Armenian. My father's Irish and we didn't, I didn't have that much contact with his family. Um, but my mom's family, we used to go visit a lot in Jersey and um, there were, it was a big family and uh, I had much more of an identification as an Armenian than I did as an Irish person, even though my last name is Irish. Socially for me, I never made contact with other Armenians, so I didn't know, it was a little strange, you know. Sometimes I would feel like I didn't want anybody to know what I was and other times um, I wanted to tell people, you know, I really wanted to tell them I wanted people to know. And now I talk about it a lot because I feel like there just aren't that many of us. My mother was born in this country, um, but my grandparents came from Turkey. And she married my father who was not um, Armenian. He was, as we call, an Odar. But in the household, we grew up actually um, with this shared identity in terms of the American culture of growing up in a suburb of Boston, as well as with the Armenian culture of um, being very close to my grandparents and lots of family being around. My grandmothers were both born in the United States and my grandfathers were both refugees from the Armenian Genocide who came as children. My father's family was brought to the United States by Protestant missionaries and they grew up in, he grew up in West Haven, Connecticut and there was no Armenian church nearby so he grew up Protestant. Um, in my mother's family, um, even though they lived near the Armenian churches in Boston, they did not go. And in fact, um, they used to send my mother to church with their downstairs tenant who was a Baptist. 
And I remember my mother telling me that my grandmother had said, oh, it doesn't matter what, where you practice, where you, um, you know, how you worship. It's all one and the same. And so there was a kind of openness in her family to multiple religious traditions, I think. My parents are genocide survivors. Uh, my father was, they were both, they both came from Turkey. I think most, most of my life growing up as a child was bathed, I think is, is probably the right word, in uh, that genocide legacy. There was a lot of depression in my family, and it was also a lot of lifefulness. And I think something that is probably very much a part of my father's identity and something that I've internalized is a statement I remember as a child going for a ride and we were lost and my mother got very very nervous very upset and very angry and very worried and frightened and he said how can you get lost this is America and that that statement um, I mean feels to me to be um, a real symbol of my life. <laughs> um, the fear on the one hand and the sense of hope and the sense of um, adventure, <laughs> and, which is very different from my family. For my report, I interviewed my great-grandmother. How wonderful that you have a great-grandmother to interview. Where is she from? She was born in Armenia. Can you show us Armenia on the map? Um, no. Okay, let's take a look. Here it is. Armenia is a republic in the Soviet Union. Um, no, because that's not where she was born. You said that she was born in Armenia. Yes, but Armenia used to be over here. Where? Can you show me on the map? Over here, kind of. The play that I'm writing about Armenians is kind of about, um, you know, having a sense of, of what it means to be Armenian, but not really wanting to deal with it, um, which is complicated and um, something I felt a lot. But I feel very much like an outsider in the Armenian community, especially now, more so now at this age than I did when I was younger. Um, I don't fit there anymore. <laughs> it doesn't allow me to have my own voice. <laughs> Probably the last eight years or so, I have found community with a group of Armenian women. Um, and I mean, we, it, has been, it has been so meaningful and so profound. Um, we have been really able to, um, I think, probably more clearly have a sense of who I am as a woman. 
um, it's really interesting because that feels like a real par it feels like a real I think paradox is the right word that I should I would be able to um, find more of my own voice in a group of Armenian women who would have ever thought that the other contributing factor to um, why I how I how I inhabit my Armenian American identity as a woman has to do with the fact that I was raised in a Unitarian church. Um, I was not raised in the Armenian church. Um, and uh, Unitarianism, as I experience it, is very spiritual and very anti dogmatic and very open to um, progressive politics and in fact has a program of social justice. I think my sense of Armenian identity um, comes from what I grew up with at a young age and the community that I grew up in was probably not all that diverse uh, racially but it was um, ethnically in some ways. Um, but I think, I think that that sense of identity came from being in a place where people actually were aware of their identities, whether they were Italian or Irish or Armenian. And as I've gotten older, um, it's continued to be important to me um, as I try to understand something about, about why I care about the things that I do and um, what's influenced all of that. And there are so many different ways to kind of work out your identity. You can be part of an ethnic community, and I don't want any part of that. But at the same time, I don't want to give up my heritage, my legacy. This is my legacy to be an Armenian. And I don't think that the people in the ethnic community have the right to define what it is. So I'm 100% Armenian, and who, whatever I am is the way to be an Armenian, is the way I feel like, because I'm conscious about it. It's not just that I have these genes but that I'm conscious about what it means to be Armenian and what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a mother and what it means to be all of the, and, and an American, and what it means to be all of the other things that make for an identity. My mother is a, you know, a feminist, so she, having been raised in a pretty traditional Armenian household, really wanted me as a girl to, to experience um, not being a traditional Armenian and not feeling like I had to get married and not feeling like, um, you know, I was really limited because I was a girl. And um, so, you know, I had things happen, like I would go to visit my grandparents and um, I would be expected to help in the kitchen and my brother wouldn't. Um, no, Odar. <laughs> Odar! She doesn't know what her own is. Odar! 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 combination, probably English, Irish, all that. And if I went in the kitchen, it was like my mother would, you know, it was weird because, you know, then I would be like being the girl and that wasn't good. But, you know, my mother would sometimes help in the kitchen and what did that mean? And everything, you know, everything meant something. So it was, it was definitely complicated. Yeah, I teach women's studies at the University of Massachusetts. And um, I, I teach about race, class, gender, and ethnicity. And that's kind of what I, I try to convey is that these things are very complex. You can't just look at what it means to be a woman because every woman has all of these identities. Every woman has a race in a racially defined culture, which the entire world is now. Um, every woman has a sexuality, whether she's heterosexual or lesbian or bisexual or transsexual or whatever. Every one of us has that. Every one of us. Um, has a gender. Um, every one of us has a class. Um, and it's much more complicated than we used to think in the 1970s when we were women and we were going to take over the world. Um, and it's much more complex, but it's much more real. My mother's an artist, and she taught me something about beholding, what it is to look at the world, how it is to see both beauty and truth. Um, how it is to see what's not seen sometimes by the culture and who's not seen. So to be able to hold in one place actually the truth of both is what I understood a God who is a God that cares can do, as painful as that is. 
Um, so in line with that, um, I guess I learned something about caring about the souls of people. And um, so much of my work, what I do now is actually I work in the church. I work for the Episcopal Church. What about you? <laughs> I'm a psychoanalyst. And I don't think there were, growing up, there were too many Armenian mentors, women especially, that I had. Um, except for one woman who was a, happened to be a nurse um, with a master's degree. Um, and sh she, she actually was the only educated Armenian woman that I knew. I wanted to be like her. I really wanted to be like her, so I became a nurse originally, um, which was very good for me in many ways, because I really was the first one in my family to go on to school, um, a family of five. There are five of us. I um, am just finished a PhD at Brown University in Rhode Island, and my PhD is in American Studies. My focus is on um, contemporary multi-ethnic literatures. It, it, it's actually no accident that I ended up in this, um, in this line of work, I think, because um, I've done uh, a lot of thinking about identity, questions of identity, questions of the body, um, questions of visibility, invisibility, dominant historical narratives, um, and how to make other historical narratives present again. So those are some of the things that have come to me um, because of my experience growing up Armenian. My grandmother's family were refugees, so they came from really from nothing. And um, and my generation, you know, I had, I, you know, I mean, I had everything as a kid. I never wanted for anything, and so that in itself made it hard for us to understand each other, you know, um, because they expected me to kind of go to college and have a profession, have a career, and I was kind of all over the place and didn't know what I wanted to do, and I was bumming around, and they were like, "What are you doing?" So. You know, there was a lot, there was a lot of ways that generationally we just didn't understand each other at all, so. My partner is, is Jewish American and we have a four, year, four and a half year old daughter. One of the cultures is really what, she, in a sense, what she is inescapably. There's no way that she cannot be American. I think that the Jewish identity and the Armenian identity, from my perspective, are more chosen for her because she could live as an American without practicing anything from either tradition, without identifying as a member of either tradition, and nothing would happen, whereas she can't really quite do that um, with the American identity. And as I've grown up, I guess I really appreciate the fact that through those various lives of people, um, it's taught me to continue to be open. So identity and taking up my own voice and being a person and a woman in my own right has been probably the story of my life. <laughs> probably what I have been struggling with um, forever and still to this day. away as much as I could what was Armenian about myself. And here I am, all these years later, still thinking about these questions. What is it to be Armenian? What does it mean to be Armenian? What does it mean to be the granddaughter and daughter of survivors and victims of the genocide?
And now I feel that all of these identities, my Armenian identity, my identity as a woman, my identity as a lesbian, um, my identity as a white person um, in a very racist culture, um, are they're with me all the time, all together. And sometimes one is foregrounded and another one isn't, you know. And as I say to my students when I try to talk about this, how all of these identities impact on each other, um, I wasn't raised an Armenian on Saturday and a woman on Sunday. You know, I am an Armenian woman and it all comes together all at the same time. I think something that's um, particular that I, that I sense in identifying as Armenian is this um, sense of memory and the importance of that, in that um, in being a people who are in exile, um, that there's a sense whether, whether people told the stories or they didn't tell the stories, memory had an incredible power. And so sometimes, um, growing up, I used to feel as though I was more pastward looking than, than future looking. Mm -hmm. That there was something of the past that bound you mm -hmm. to one another and to place and to no place. There's something about rootedness and connection and um, a sense of oneself mm -hmm. that has a history and a root. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of like a connectedness. Mm. I think becoming more Armenian in a certain way because I think it's about um, deciding what it is for me. Mm -hmm. um, but that has a lot to do with memory and connection. Mm. And um, really connecting to things that are important to me. Um, genocide, music, art. To me it goes back to what you said, Shaka, earlier about it is what you are. As a kid, you know, I mean, that's mm -hmm. what you are. That's what you, that's what you are. You don't know anything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, for me, doesn't go away. We try to cover it up. I try to cover it up, and I try to get away from it. But essentially, it doesn't go away. That feeling of home, in a way. Mm -hmm. And this isn't to romanticize and say that it was wonderful, but mm -hmm. that's what we knew, you right. know. And so for me, it feels like it's pre-verbal. Mm -hmm. So it's like body and smell and touch mm -hmm. yeah, uh -huh. and, it, and sensory motor. And, and kind of an introduction this. to the world. Mm -hmm. Like what does the world look like from this perspective? Mm -hmm. And this perspective is the perspective, you know, until you go out into the world. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes more complicated and layered. I think um, for me too, it was the sense of growing up in two places at once, this place that I lived in in this place I'd never been, but I'd always been there. Mm -hmm. And so to know this village of Kozoluk, um, and to know it was both this you know, field of poppies and play and a field of bloodshed and everything, but I grew up living these stories and in such a way that, um, that, that, that I was there, um, being an exile at home any place in the world, and that I wasn't attached to any place, but that I was at home any place. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think some of that comes from this sense of place that is no longer. It's, it's such a different experience because I heard no stories, uh, you know. Uh, there was a silence which was powerful, mm, you know, the stories not being told, uh, yeah. you know. And I don't know, you know, I know so little about the village and, you mm. know, there's so little that I know mm. and it wasn't talked about and then, mm. but there were asides about the other side. And, mm. and I know that silence is also part of the story for me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's part of the invisibility, too. Yes. You know, the whole, I mean, what, you know, like, the whole thing about, for me, I mean, I, I think it's all, it was so shadowy for so much of my childhood uh -huh. that, um, it, it's, it's, um, again, easy to say I'm something else or just ignore it completely. But then, at the same time, I used to want to be part of it. You know, and especially because I, I was only half Armenian, I wanted, I wanted to be told that I looked Armenian or that I hmm. was Armenian. You know, I wanted to be part of it, but then I didn't really know what that meant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like wanting to be part of a club, but not knowing mm -hmm. what it is mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
just because I wanted a sense of belonging. But then I don't think that the people in that club knew what they belonged to either. So mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. it was very confusing. I mean, I knew that the food linked everybody, mm -hmm. and I knew that when I was maybe sixteen, I went to a, a music performance in Ithaca, and it was an Armenian music. Um, recital and everybody there, a lot of people there were Armenian. It was the first time I'd been in a room full of people that were Armenian that I wasn't related to huh. in my life. And everybody looked like me. Hmm. Oh, wow. And it was amazing. I was going to say something more about this question of choice versus it's what you are. Um, and that is that I grew up really having a sense that more that it was cho chosen mm -hmm. because I lived in a place where there weren't a lot of other Armenians. And I didn't choose to ever to not say I was, but that it was more, it was more about choice in my family. But I think that where I've come now is right, is that I'm recognizing that my psychology is not, which I have not chosen, is very invested in and wrapped up in um, Armenian history. Mm -hmm. the, the cultural dif questions of cultural difference, the um, revisions of history, those kinds of issues which are very deep, mm -hmm. have really wound their way into my psychology. And so that's the level at which I feel mm -hmm. I don't choose. Mm -hmm. But that goes back to, I think, what you know in your family. Yes. And what you don't, mm -hmm. what, your introduction to the world yes. is an Armenian introduction. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I didn't yeah. know it. Right. I, I didn't have that sense when I was little. No, 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 because Be it is the world. Right. Right. So you but don't I have any, you don't right. have any but objectivity I about it. But I just it. felt, in some ways, I just felt, well, I'm American. Mm -hmm. And I didn't recognize that my introduction to the world was an Armenian right. introduction. Mm -hmm. I thought it was an American, and it was, mostly. Right. But there were these other dimensions of it that were not an American introduction, mm -hmm. that I've only reconstructed later. Well, you know, also your, your, your parents, um, your grandparents were survivors. Mm -hmm. So I just, I think it's probably interesting that it, it would be something different. I mean, I don't know any, I didn't know anything different. Right. I didn't know any, right. any other. Mm -hmm. Right. There was, like there was no choice. Right. Because we, we ate it and we slept it right. and we drank it and we yeah. touched it right. and mm -hmm. smelled it. Right. Yeah, I and, think that's you know, so generational right. too. I think that so is generational. generational. Yeah. Because I could, I could go, you know, I could not think about it right. uh -huh. very easily. Uh -huh. yeah. I think I probably think about it every day of my life in some way. Some of you hear me kid too about that Pedushan factor, the part that has to do with not really mm -hmm. a feeling. Um, I don't know, as though you don't deserve to be in a particular mm -hmm. place or being quick to step aside and um, I think that is something to do with being both um, somebody of exile but also in the class stuff for at least in terms of the family that I grew up in. I grew up probably more middle class, upper middle class but the roots of my family's identity and it's still its psychology were very poor mm -hmm. and so yeah. the combination of, um, of, of I think being persecuted as well as them being in a whole other class there was both the health of personhood, but also this Pedushan factor that mm -hmm. crops up. It surprises me mm -hmm. when it comes up. But there's another part, though, that I want to talk about, and it's being American. You know, that we are Armenian-American mm -hmm. or American-Armenians, you know, depending on your emphasis. And I think that very much shapes us, not only that we mm -hmm. grow up in this country and we take on Americanness, but mm -hmm. that shapes our Armenianness. Right. Because if we grew up in the Middle East, Mm. We would be living in probably enclosed, mm. somewhat enclosed 
ethnic communities, we would uh -huh. be one among many ethnicities that mm -hmm. would stay fairly yes. um, distinct. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this so-called melting pot, you know, there isn't anything like non -melting that. Non-melting really. pot. You know, I mean, it, it's not true that there isn't anything like that because there are ghettos. There are lots of ghettos. There were Armenian ghettos. Yeah, but the, but the thing is to become one of, to become an American. That's kind of the impetus, you know. Mm -hmm. So that shapes our lives, but it also shapes how Armenian right. develops, Armenianness develops right. mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. in in the United States from, say, Syria or mm -hmm. Egypt. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Lebanon. And right. it's so varied depending on where you where you are. I mean, if you live somewhere where there's no other Armenians, which is how I spent most of my life, right. I mean, no other Armenians mm -hmm. at all, that's, you know, you really feel like a freak, basically. Right. I mean, it's so, just that simple. So, for instance, the exoticness is particular to, a, you know, a European-American context. Right. That you wouldn't, if you lived in the Middle East, people you wouldn't, wouldn't perceive right. you as exotic. Mm. So that becomes part of the way, what it means to some of us to be Armenian, to be Armenian. Mm -hmm. but, but that's very particular to you. Yeah, but even if you live somewhere where there's so many other cultures, like where I live in New York, there's mm -hmm. I hear 15 different languages on my right. way to the post office. So I don't necessarily see other Armenians, but I see a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense that everybody's from somewhere else. Right. And, and I feel more at home there. You know, than I have right. anywhere in my life, right. actually. I think that's true. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 And it doesn't matter, you know, so much where particularly people are from. It sounds weird, but it's true because mm -hmm. everybody's from somewhere else. Right. Do you feel at home there because you identify more now as Armenian? Or what's the I, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I think I feel, I feel like I blend in. I feel like I belong. Mm -hmm. I feel like I don't. I mean, this is partly because I spent two years in the Midwest where I really, I didn't look mm -hmm. like anybody. And people would actually say things like, did you dye your hair that color? Yeah. And ask me weird questions that I didn't want to answer. So I felt very exotic in not such a good way there. Mm -hmm. And in New York, I feel like I can, in a lot of ways, it's not just about how I look or being Armenian. It's about how I dress and how I live my life. But I don't feel like I, I, um, I stand out there. And I l really like that. I really like feeling like I blend in. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting to me that, that our otherness is, re I, I never thought about that, is, is really, I mean, I've always felt comfortable in New York. Mm -hmm. Very Everybody's comfortable other. in New York. But, you know, it's like our otherness is really the context. Mm -hmm. Otherness right. is Other, the context. It's, it's the living. exception, it's the rule rather than the exception. Here's a toast to the other community. <laughs> to the other side. What other community? Yeah, we're the yeah, what are you talking that's about? What I mean. So we're toasting yes, this. That's okay, what I, I mean. Want, you know, I want the world to be clear what we're talking about. <laughs> no, we're I want to know what I'm toasting here. Yeah. What am I toasting here? We're toasting I know, I know. We're toasting, toasting our community. We're toasting us. What your desire was either to reconnect or to form your identity as, as you wanted to within mm -hmm. terms you could accept. Actually, I never, I never wanted to connect with the Armenian community. I, mm -hmm. I never even considered it because it's so conservative politically. It's mm -hmm. so racist. Mm -hmm. It's so homophobic. It's so sexist. Mm -hmm. I can't be myself. I can't be who I am mm -hmm. in the Armenian community. So I don't really want any part of that at all. Mm -hmm. But to be able to participate in some of the events of parts of the community with my political self mm -hmm. feels very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think then, out of that, you can make connections with people and mm -hmm. begin to form mm -hmm. your own communities. I think I was pretty steeped in it, in the Armenian community, until, um, it's interesting, until I left home at 23 and came to mm -hmm. New York. And then the only involvement was cultural. Just, mm -hmm. I mean, really cultural. Antoinette joined Antoinette dance. Um, but I began to feel more and more like it wasn't anything about who I was other than that cultural piece, the music I loved. Um, but the people were very unfamiliar to me. I mean, they were familiar mm -hmm. and unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, um, didn't hold my values. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean by unfamiliar? They didn't hold your values? Yeah. Because they are very yeah. familiar. Mm. No. They're very familiar, but 
they were unfamiliar, I think, to the part of me that was um, growing and developing mm -hmm. and getting more education and being more expansive. And, um, and I really felt like um, a freak there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's more really about more adulthood, more. you know, like what you're talking about, what you're talking about too. It's about becoming an adult. Mm -hmm. And that, that whole thing of, I think anytime you're, you're dealing with something that, that was all encompassing and sort of you had no perspective on as a child, mm -hmm. when you come into your own as an adult, you're able to kind of go right. into it to right. a certain degree and maintain some sense of identity. Right. It, yeah, but it, it takes like, being separate It takes being first, separate. Yeah. and then you can go back. Right. It, absolutely. I wonder for me it was both... Um, familiar and in some ways different enough that that I could pick and choose how I related. So it wasn't as encompassing an environment that I grew up in. I felt a real <clears throat> difference between my family and even most of my extended family on the one hand in which I felt mostly pretty comfortable being in an Armenian community because it was a family community. And then there was this other Armenian community that I had no connection to at all, except that, you know, every once in a while, like on Easter, we would go to church, and I wouldn't understand, mm. you know, what was said, but I would smell the incense, and so there was that. Um, but also that um, the culture of that Armenian community seemed somehow different from my own family mm. and my extended family. So there's a way in which, and it's sort of a puzzle to me, but there's a way in which I feel more comfortable and have felt totally comfortable in some ways on this fringe. Like it's harder for me to be in a community than to be on the fringe of it, because to me that's normal. Like that's the normal thing. And that um, that's what was, my, what was my world, was that we were on this edge and we'd sort of always been on this edge. Let's see, none, none of my Armenian friends had any aspirations to go on to school. Mm -hmm. None. Mm -hmm. So I was, mm. I was an outsider in that group just with that, mm -hmm. the idea of wanting wow. to go, go mm. to school. Wow. And then um, when I moved to New York, other than Antarnik, I really felt very outside. Mm -hmm. But I was involved in a whole other new world that was very mm -hmm. exciting to me. Mm -hmm. And I think really, really it wasn't until I met Arlene that I couldn't believe that I had met someone that was like me, mm -hmm. that held mm -hmm. my values, mm -hmm. and she was Armenian. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. Very powerful for me, too, when we met. And you, you said that this is the first time, I'll never forget this, you said this is the first time that I've been able to be an Armenian and an adult in the mm -hmm. same space. Mm -hmm. wow. And I think for women, mm -hmm. there is no adult space right. in the Armenian community outside of the very traditional roles. And it doesn't recognize things that we do. I mean, I think you're saying you've been able to, you know, to find some ways of being in, in the community and have recognition and have sort of some place. But I feel in general that there's this level at which we get ignored, Absolutely. and what we do gets ignored and passed over, and people don't think of including mm -hmm. or recognizing um, accomplishments or achievements. And part of it is that we're women, I think, but part right. of it is our mm -hmm. politics. When you were talking about being recognized for some of the ways mm -hmm. that you have made accomplishments and contributions, and <clears throat> I agree with you that for, um, in regard to politics, that that's the big deciding piece of it, but there's pride sometimes for, I would imagine, men and women who have different accomplishments but are much more geared towards the success story mm -hmm. on an American Absolutely. scale. Mm -hmm. So Business. there's recognition, Business. Business. Right. but it's recognition within the classism uh, that exists, which right. is a whole different political thing. Right. But I, I guess I'm still sort of struck by your two stories that I think it is partly because you grew up more within, in some ways, an enclave or enclosure, in some ways, too, of an Armenian community more than I did. Mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe that's partly from having the identity of a father who's not Armenian. But the, the underlying culture was Armenian in the household. And, but then I'm struck by, in some ways, the values of 
my grandparents who were really proud of their children who mm -hmm. became an artist and a mm. priest and a musician. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they weren't the big mm -hmm. achievers. Mm -hmm. um, and all of them married um, Odars, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it, and I think that probably my grandfather might have had some sadness about that, but it was accepted, you know, that, that there was mm -hmm. freedom that was given in the household. And so for me, that experience of Armenian identity is not being a place of freedom at times, or the possibility to come into maturation and the gifts of your own identity. I didn't experience that from that side of the identity, but I, again, didn't grow up as much um, with it from all sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, again, the only community I ever really experienced was my family, and I didn't really, I don't think they knew what to make of me, because I, I didn't really do any of the right things, you know, I didn't, initially I didn't go to school, I dropped out of high school, and then um, you know, I don't now, even though I've been to school and I've got an education, I mean, I live from paycheck to paycheck and I write and I don't have any kind of security and I'm in debt and, you know, I'm not, I'm not, certainly not a business success story and I'm certainly not, um, not something that I think they would look at and say, this is, you know, mm. this is good, this is like mm. a solid citizen, you know. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's hard, it's hard to, um, it's always been hard to explain myself. Mm. You know, it's mm. always like, so what are you doing now? Mm. You know, well, mm. well I don't know. <laughs> and I can add up all the little pieces, but it doesn't feel like it adds up to anything. Mm. Like mm -hmm. I can say I'm doing this and this and this. Mm. And if I were talking to somebody else, it would sound like something. Mm. But when I'm talking to them, it doesn't sound like anything. Mm. I hear myself say it, it's like, mm. I'm not doing anything. And, so. and you left out the one major thing, too, that you didn't do. And you did get married. Well, there's that. Yes. Yes. No, and there is that. And, you know, I mean, I, they were talking to me about that. I mean, great-grandma would talk to me about that when I was 12. Mm -hmm. you know? <clears throat> 12? Wow. Yeah. Wow. I remember I was eating my Fruit Loops sitting at the table. <laughs> and she said, so, when are you going to get married? And I was wow. like, wow. It's like, well, it's not really in the plan right now. <laughs> but she started talking about finding me a nice Armenian boy. Mm -hmm. You know? Wow. And I was like... Good luck. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the fingers about your yeah, own yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, that's a good story. story. This is the smoking with the fingers. <laughs> you it's a marital right. <laughs> it's ancient. very good because it's it's, it speaks so much of silence, this story. Why? Because they didn't talk about why their fingers were cut off? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't talk about that. They didn't talk about You didn't know what it was. Right. right. You knew nothing. Right, so I knew nothing. Right, I did. I made yeah, it all yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my great aunt and great uncle were first cousins and Oops, trouble started there yeah it's problematic and they each cut off the same finger within a year of each other on different machines it was the lawnmower and the table saw because uncle made the you know backgammon boards and stuff in the basement yeah. so they both had these fingers that were cut off, and they both smoked, and they had these um, vinyl cigarette cases with little lighters, you know, little lighter things. And so they would sit at the table, and they would smoke like this because their fingers were cut off. <laughs> <laughs> and they would sit kind of the same way, and they were about the same height, you know, and they would sit there like this, and they'd smoke like this. And I would look at them, and I'd think, is this like an ancient Armenian marriage ritual? <laughs> <laughs> they have these fingers cut off, and they smoke... Like this. <laughs> Big marriage looked really good, huh? Well, and as it turns out, their marriage was arranged, which I didn't know. So, and I didn't know they were first cousins either. I mean, as a kid, all I knew was that they looked alike, they were married, and they had no fingers, and they would smoke like this. And I thought, God, help me. You know? What do they have in store for me?